From Embark's headquarters in Dallas, Texas, this is Accounting Matters, an accounting podcast powered by Embark. Hi, hello, good afternoon. It's great to be with each of you. I'm Zach Smith, Embark's East Region Market President, and I'm joined with my co-host, Adam Olson, Embark's Accounting Advisory Practice Leader. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing the digital business language widely used around the world, XBRL. To help us in this discussion, we're here with Sarah Kiefer, a Managing Director in Embark's Financial Accounting Practice. Adam, Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, glad to be here. <laughs> welcome, Sarah. Yeah, welcome, Sarah. Sarah, this is your first time on the show. It's my first time on the show. Well, great. <laughs> well, we're so happy to have you here and looking forward to what we're going to talk about today. So, Adam, we're here today to talk about XBRL. Can you start off by giving our listeners a little bit of background and exactly what is XBRL? Yeah, so XBRL, kind of like you mentioned, your opening really is kind of the business reporting language that's used widely across the globe for financial financial and business reporting. Um, it's more or less just an XML-based markup language that really kind of serves as the international standard, I said, for uh, financial reporting across the globe. And XBRL as a whole, it's managed centrally by an organization called XBRL International, which is a global not-for-profit consortium, which is made up of over 600 public and private organizations that span over 50 different countries. And really at the center of XBRL, like its main purpose really is just to enable kind of creation of definitions and relationships that exist within financial reporting. And they accomplish this through different taxonomies. So you'll hear the, you know, that phrase or that term thrown around taxonomies, which are essentially just kind of like a dictionary um, of these different types of financial concepts and attributes and relationships that exist in reporting. And so each concept in a taxonomy more or less is going to re represent a different type of accounting term or a different disclosure type item. Um, and it'll provide a standard definition for what each of those mean. Okay. Standardized language, standardized definition. So what was the catalyst though for actually needing this language? It, yeah. So if you think about just like any transformation from kind of, you know, analog type digital type stuff, it's really just centered around the need for more quick reliance and transparent information. So if you think about prior to XBRL, someone needing to understand different relationships between items and financial reporting or across different entities, it was a very manual process. So a lot of digging on their own, having to read through things, um, really kind of taking out the machine learning element that XBRL provides um, by not having that, that ability you know, in the past. And so XBRL really introduces the ability to decipher information on a more timely, more accurate, and more reliable basis for stakeholders. Okay, super helpful. So let's talk a little bit about who actually came up with this concept. I'm hearing you say standardized language for accounting and finance reviews, et cetera. Yep. I would think that potentially one of the big accounting firms potentially came up with this, or was this more an investor advisory group? Where did this come from? Yeah, so the short answer to your question is no, it wasn't a major accounting firm or, you know, advisory or investor group or panel that kind of came up with the idea of XBRL. There was actually a single individual, a single CPA named Charlie Hoffman. Um, so through my research, who actually, you know, originated the concept of creating like a digital language for business. And so to help bring his idea to fruition, you know, he, he really engaged the AICPA to help develop what we now know as XPRL and help provide that kind of global standard that we now use across financial reporting um, around the world. And through the efforts of the AICPA and its members, you know, they, they essentially helped create the larger framework that we now know about. So the specifications, the different taxonomies that exist. Um, and, and really, XBRL really was under the jurisdiction of the ASCPA for quite a while. And that wasn't up until, you know, 15 or so years ago, back in 2006, um, where it was kind of spun off as its own independent kind of body to, um, you know, manage XBRL on a go forward basis. Great. So, Sarah, I'm going to flip on over to you. Adam touched briefly on the taxonomies. Um, can you explain a little bit further around that relationship and exactly what, what that is and how that all comes into play here? Yeah, for sure. So kind of like Adam was mentioning, a taxonomy is like a big dictionary, right? So you've got 
all these different terms and all these grouping of financial concepts. They're known as elements. Um, and then each concept is defined. So um, in addition to having all these concepts that are defined um, like a big dictionary, it also talks about the relationship of those concepts. So for example, you've got cash. So your cash is defined um, within that taxonomy, but then you also have that relationship where it rolls up into your current assets and then it rolls up into total assets. And then so all three of those things would be financial concepts that are defined in that taxonomy, but also the relationship between all of them. So there are thousands and thousands of different types of taxonomies. Um, for example, in US GAAP alone, there's like over 15,000 different elements. Wow. Taxonomy. Yeah. Okay. So 15,000 different elements. I can imagine that it's difficult to maintain and update and okay. define all of these. Who's responsible for that? Yeah. So the taxonomies are um, developed by regulators, governmental agencies, and accounting standard setters. So you're thinking like the FASB, um, FERC. Um, so like the FASB actually develops our two like more commonly used um, taxonomies, which is going to be like your um, GAAP financial reporting taxonomy and your SEC reporting taxonomy. Collectively, those are referred to the U.S. GAAP taxonomy. Um, the SEC began requiring XBRL for public companies and the FASB assumed responsibility of development of that taxonomy and then also to keep it consistent with updates to U.S. GAAP. Um, the FASB still manages U.S. GAAP taxonomy today as it is ever evolving with any kind of new U.S. GAAP updates. Okay. Now, I've heard a lot around the term taxonomy extension used before. Can you clarify a little bit about what that means exactly? Yeah, for sure. So the X in XBRL stands for extensible. Like, So if a particular concept is not in that current taxonomy, if something is really specific to your company in particular, um, you can actually extend the taxonomy and create your own concept. And that is an extension concept. Um, and then that basically makes it very widely adaptable and um, and used for all different companies. Okay. Now, I know you touched on this just briefly a second ago, but exactly who's required to use XBRL? Yeah. So there are various regulators who require uh, companies to basically tag their submitted financials and business reports with XBRL. That's like the SEC, FERC, um, the FDIC does as well. But probably the most prevalent when you're thinking about this is going to be your SEC requirements for public filers. So back in 2009, the SEC um, had the Interactive Data to Improve Financial Reporting Act, and that mandated public companies to provide their financial statements in XBRL format. Um, then fast forward to 2018, they came out and started mandating, um, mandating filers to submit an inline XBRL um, and basically like a phased rollout. So um, the inline XBRL format embeds the XBRL into HTML document. Um, now you have interactive data in what they call like a human readable format. So your human readable format is that HTML, like you can see it on the website. Mm -hmm. And now you also have the interactive data where you can click through and see the tags within that document. Okay. Then in 2019, the FAST Act for Modernization and Simplification of Regulation SK was approved and included a requirement for the inline XBRL tagging of your 8K cover page. So now if you've got an 8K, you have to tag your cover page as well. Okay. Um, then in recent years, FERC came out and started requiring XBRL tagging as well. Um, this is like for your public company, public utility companies, electric companies, thinking like natural gas, pipeline, that kind of thing. Um, they also have quarterly and annual filings that now have to be um, XBRL tagged as well. Um, and it's, it's important to note that that taxonomy that's used for those FERC filings is not the same as your SEC. So when we're talking about the different taxonomies, you've got a different taxonomy for FERC requirements and then versus like your US GAAP taxonomy that you're using in SEC. Okay, so it sounds like a lot of organizations yes. are using this. <laughs> this is widely used across public companies, um, utility and electrical companies. So Adam, you know, I wanna come back over to you. I know that Sarah mentioned the SEC mandate and inline XBRL on a phased rollout approach. Yep. Is it effective for all types of SEC filers at this point or is there some sort of leeway that they're giving? No, it's unfortunately now. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess it depends on who's doing work. But yeah. uh, all registrants now um, have to apply inline XBRL. So the original rule when it came out allowed for kind of a three year phase in. So obviously starting with your largest registrants, so your large accelerated filers were kind of in that first wave. Then you had your kind of just your accelerated filers in that second wave. And then back in 2021, it was kind of like the final wave of folks had to get on board. 
and, and comply with inline XBRL. So that was the final wave of people that had to, to implement and include it in their filings. So great, Adam. Talk to me a little bit about private company filings, their initial registration statements as part of an IPO. Are they required to comply with these rules as well? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's definitely one thing, just this concept of XBRL that we have conversations with when there are private companies that are kind of exploring that IPO path is just something to think about as a responsibility of being a public company is that you will now have to do this. Um, but fortunately for them as part of kind of the IPO process, the initial initial registration statement, so their Form S1, it does not have to comply with XBRL uh, because they aren't a public company at that point. You know, if the IPO goes through and they become a registrant and then kind of on their, you know, subsequent periodic filings and things of that nature that they're going to have to submit, they would eventually have to get in line with the requirements of XBRL. So it's definitely something that they need to be attuned to and make sure that they're ready to, to be prepared for. So some good news for private companies, they get a little bit of relief with all the other work that they're running through. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not that an IPO is an easy undertaking, of there's, not. <laughs> but it's one less thing that they have to be like yeah. kind of sorting through at that time. Um, but it's not going to be that much you know, the, the timeline after becoming a registrant to when you're going to have to comply is not that long. So it's something they have to be ready for pretty quickly. Something to keep in mind. Okay. So Adam, does the use of inline XBRL require any sort of specific tool or software to view and read this information? No, it doesn't. And, you know, anyone that's been to the SEC's website, so you've gone and you kind of the Edgar website to look at, you know, filings, you, you'll you know as you kind of click through filings and click on different tags and things like that, It it's all very accessible and readable. And that's because the SEC more or less built the software kind of integrated into Edgar when they rolled out the inline XBRL. So there's no downloads or anything that you have to do specifically for like a user of that information for someone that wants to view the filings. Okay, so that's helpful. Sarah, I want to come back over to you and I want to dig a little bit deeper into SEC filers. Are there any specific requirements for SEC filers for XBRL? There are. Yeah. So public companies, you have to if you're filing financial statements with the SEC, you need to tag your face financials, every number's got to be tagged, every table, um, your accounting policies and your footnotes. Um, so the recovery page is also required and auditor information. So those are newer. Um, basically, there's four different levels of tagging required by the SEC. And we can kind of walk through those a little bit. Um, but level one is like your text blocks. So each footnote is tagged as a text block. So say you have like your first footnote is the organization footnote. That whole entire footnote is tagged as a text block. Um, level two is going to be like your accounting policy text block. So every single accounting policy that's little Normally this falls in like footnote two-ish range. Um, every single policy within that footnote has to be tagged as well. That's what your level two tags are. Level three are gonna be your table text blocks. So any table or schedule that's within a footnote has to be tagged as well, including that wording right before the table. Um, so that's tagged level three, basically saying what that table is. Then you're gonna go down into level four, which is like your detail tags. So that's all your numbers that are within that footnote, um, all in, in the tables and everything. So every detail within that within that note. Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> How much effort does it take for somebody to, to run through this? Is this days of work? Is this uh, relatively easy? Are there any tools that help with this tagging? Yeah, it's definitely a lot of work, a lot of effort. Um, you definitely want to get a good tool to help you. Uh, we really like Workiva like helps a lot. Okay. Um, they have a lot of really good XBRL tools that's very um, user friendly, easy to use, um, really helps you build out that outline, tag everything, make sure you haven't missed anything. And they have really cool review features as well. That's wonderful. And shameless plug to our listeners. We've got a strong <laughs> partnership with Workiva. And Sarah, I know that you're part of that um, team that works with them. So we great do. to hear that that tool is helpful with this. Yep. You know, Sarah, coming back to it, I want to know if a company is required to tag their document, where do they even start? How do they even begin this process? Yeah, so most of your softwares that you use to file your financials um, will typically have an XBRL feature as well. Workiva definitely does. So typically, you'll use that software to tag your document. I like to start with level one. It just is easier to kind of help build out that outline. So you start with level one, and you're basically building out from the top down to all those little details 
um, what all is supposed to be tagged. So, so it's just a continual double click, if you will. Right? right, basically. And you're just going down and drilling down into all the details. So if you have, um, like, let's just say like a 10Q or something, and you're going through and tagging that, um, you also want it to be like basically in the same order as what's presented in your queue. So you'd essentially have like your cover page, your financial statements, um, and then all the different footnotes within there. So your outline would look really similar to that. So if you kind of start with your outline, start with the footnotes first, and then kind of break it down um, into all those details, it's really easy to kind of build and build upon that as your company grows or your footnotes change. Okay, Sarah, how can you review your XBRL tags reports prior to filing them? And what are some common errors that we need to look out for? Yeah. So, you know, like we were talking about before, there are like thousands of tags in any particular document. So it can be really, really difficult to find an efficient way to go through and review these. Um, luckily, Workiva makes, can make it easy on you. Great. Um, but basically, there's a few tools that we use. Um, Workiva has something called an SEC viewer. So this is my favorite one. You're basically going in, you're looking at it exactly as it's going to appear on the SEC website. So you can see your outline, you can see the actual document, you can click in and like actually click on all the different tags and make sure they seem reasonable. Um, it's a good way to kind of go through and look like, oh, this number wasn't tagged and you notice it. So that that's probably number one is taking that SEC viewer look. Um, but you definitely want to have a software such as Workiva because basically it's going to help you catch any technical errors. Um, you don't want to like be last minute filing with the SEC and realize you've got 200 technical errors and you can't file because your XPRL is not compliant. Um, so being able to like generate that XPRL well in advance of filing, um, spend time reviewing that is going to be pretty critical. Um, so every time you basically generate XPRL, Workiva is going to notify you of those errors um, that would basically prevent filing or warnings that may, may like your information may not be correct, like potentially a calculation error, duplicate facts, you've got accuracy issues, negative value warnings. Um, so those are some common errors that we typically see. Um, and then we'll go through and basically clear them out and make sure that um, we're ready to file whenever it comes time to filing. Um, another tool that we like to use that Workiva offers is um, a calculation report. So the calculation report is going to show the relationships. Kind of like we're going back to that cash. Um, you've got your like current assets and your total assets. You're seeing a calculation report and basically has all your line items and the totals that they're supposed to come back to. Make sure everything's calculating correctly. So when you're also tagging your XBRL, you have to basically set up calculations to show what's adding up to what, which concepts are adding up to what totals. Um, these calculation errors, they're not going to prevent you from filing, but they should be reviewed and corrected prior to filing. You can basically go from there and test file your document and see if anything else is popping out. Test filing will, will show you any critical errors that are going to cause you to not be able to file, but it's not going to ensure that you are you're attacking everything accurately and in accordance with the SEC guidelines. So you still need to like fully understand XBRL, review everything yourself, um, which is what I like to do in that SEC viewer. That's awesome. Yeah. Helpful there. Adam, uh, let's, let's step back a little bit um, and talk further around any recent developments for XBRL from an, for SEC registrants. Anything there that we need to talk to? Yeah, so there's a couple new items, I guess maybe just throw on people's radar. So the, the first one relates to a new disclosure requirement that public companies are going to be tackling with in their kind of 2023 proxy season. So the new kind of pay versus performance disclosure um, that got solidified last year and is now effective for proxies filings this year. And we talked about that on an earlier podcast. Correct. Yeah, we've talked about that not only at, yeah on, on a full length of an Accounting Matters podcast, but as well as on our, our AM Now weekly show. I think we've highlighted some things around that. But um, with this new disclosure requirement, it, it's also being kind of pulled into kind of the um, inline XBRL tagging requirements. So just something else to keep in mind as you are, you know, crafting that new disclosure, it's also going to be subject to the tagging requirements. Yeah. And then, and then just another update that's more specific to uh, business development companies and close end funds is, you know, they also have some new requirements around tagging in their quarterly, annual and current reports that must also now um align with inline XBRL. So this includes like their cover page, auditor information, financial statement information um, needs to be tagged now using the US GAAP taxonomy. Um, and, you know, those business development companies and close end funds can also submit their N2 cover page and certain other prospectus information using the new closed end funds taxonomy as well. 
Okay. So just some smaller updates. Like I said, there's there's always constant changes to different taxonomies that we've talked about, new re- new requirements as the SEC puts forth new rules, um, things that'll get kind of pulled into this requirement to use XBRL. So I think it's, as you're just thinking about preparing and, and complying with these new requirements, you also kind of have to also factor in the element of, you know, making sure the XBRL tagging and everything else is... Uh, is in situation is yeah. situated well as well. Okay. Now, Adam, I know that we've talked about um, on this podcast specifically about the rise in voluntary and soon to be mandatory sustainability or ESG reporting. Yep. As final rulemaking and standard setting takes place both domestically in the U.S. and even more so from an international perspective, will XBRL play a role here too? Yeah. I mean, I think we we've already seen it, and and even if people haven't been paying close attention to some of the kind of inroads where XBRL is now being kind of thrown around. I mean, it's just stepping back conceptually and thinking about how vastly improved financial reporting has become because of XBRL. It's it's kind of a no-brainer that it would carry forward to sustainability reporting because um, in many stakeholders' minds, sustainability reporting is just as important, if not more important, than traditional financial reporting. So it's definitely an area where we'll see and have seen that um, kind of continue to grow and become important, important aspect of that. But just to maybe highlight a few areas where we've seen some movement already around sustainability reporting. So, you know, back in 2021, for example, um, the SASB released their own kind of taxonomy for X, or their XBRL taxonomy, which really covered kind of the industry specific disclosures that the SASB standards had at the time. So already moving forward there. Um, last year, you know, the IFRS, they issued kind of a, a feedback on sustainability disclosure taxonomy that they kind of put forth. So just, you know, you can see that they're also trying to make some headway around creating a taxonomy around kind of IFRS. So the ISSB and their initiatives um, around sustainability reporting. And we expect to see something finalized around that taxonomy sometime in 2023. Um, and then even more recently, you know, it was in May of, of 22. Um, EFRAG, which is kind of the the central group that's really moving forth with the the kind of European sustainability standards that fall under the CSRD initiative, um, they've also kind of moved forward with kind of publishing their first draft of kind of the XBRL taxonomy for for that rule as well. So there's on all different fronts, we're kind of seeing some movement there. So you know, it's only a matter of time until we start seeing those types of reporting being you know tagged as well using XBRL, similar to financial reporting. Okay. Well, listen, I think that we covered a lot of information here. I I know personally, I can say I did not know all of this around <laughs> XBRL. So Sarah, I really appreciate the insight and the knowledge that you brought here um, and all that you do here at Embark around this and your work with Workiva. So thank you. thank you. Adam, as always, a pleasure. And to our listeners, thank you so much for joining us um, on this week's episode of the Accounting Matters podcast. Uh, we'll see you next time.